Hi, welcome to the readingroom.com uh, author hangout. Today I have a great pleasure to introduce you to the New York Times bestselling author Diane Chamberlain. He's a much loved author of over 20 novels and is very, very well known for her trademark twists and turns of the plot and amazing descriptions of human relationships and I think especially the ones in the family, between family members and close friends. We are today to discuss her brand new novel, Necessary Lies, a riveting story that takes us back in time to 1960s, a rural south. This is the kind of a story that you will not forget for a very long time. It will probably keep you reading till late, late, late at night. And I think you will not forget it mainly because it's a story that has a lot of interesting questions that have no easy answers and often probably have more than one answer. It's also the kind of a story that I think clearly made a very strong impact on Diane, and I have no doubt that somebody who read the book that it will make a major impact on a lot of readers, which will probably send you searching for some of the sites to find out what happened to some of the people that Diane is talking about in her book. Um, Diane, we are thrilled to have you at the readingroom.com. Welcome. Thank you so much, Anna. I'm thrilled to be here. And welcome also to our members that uh, join us here for this conversation, to Bree and Amy. Hi. Hi. So, Diane, um, before we ask you about the, uh, about the book itself, uh, we all know that a lot of writers are also great readers. And of course, our site is the site that uh, gets together a lot of readers. So I was wondering if I could start this conversation by asking you about Diane the Reader. What is your earliest memory of reading? My earliest memory is reading um, The Little Red Hen. It was a, a little golden book, which I, in the United States they were the little books that we all started reading. And I read it all by myself, so I was very proud of myself. But I would say my favorite novel from childhood was Charlotte's Web because uh, yeah. it's, it has everything. It has the tension and the drama and characters that you sympathize with and uh, when I read that book I decided I wanted to be a writer. Hmm. Well that must have been pretty early on. It was very early. It was first grade. <laughs> Now, if I ask you, if you could choose to be one fictional character from all the books that you have read, who would you choose and why? Oh my gosh, that's a difficult question. Um, I sure don't want to be anybody in any of my books because I put them through way too much agony. Um, I don't know that I don't know a good answer to that question. I'll have to think about that one. I'll pop up in about five minutes with an answer. Well, we might come back to you at the end of this conversation to check. Now, I'm going to hand off uh, to our members and maybe ask uh, Bree to start our conversation um, about Necessary Life. I guess what, um, how did you decide on the storyline? What made you want to write something like a, a novel like this? Well, um, when I moved to North Carolina in 2005, I started hearing about the forced sterilization program. And I'm a former social worker, and so it really was astonishing to me to know that social workers had the power to make these decisions over people's lives. And um, in 2008, I wrote a proposal to write a novel that was that focused on that program. Um, but at that time, my agent discouraged me from it, and so I put it aside and I wrote three more books. And then um, in 2011, there were hearings in North Carolina during which people could who had been sterilized against their will could testify to what happened to them. And so at that point I decided I really had to write the book and I wrote a new proposal and um, 
was able to get a contract to write it, and so that's that's where it came from. It's just um, it's such a human story, and to see all these people in North Carolina that this happened to, I knew I had to tell the story, but I needed to make it up. I needed to make it about fictional people and not try to to write about any one particular person's story. So that's where it came from. That was the inspiration. Is that just the part of, you know, have you, re is that just part of North Carolina that you um, researched or have you done um, like research, you know, throughout the entire U.S.? Or? It, it was in 31 states where there were laws where people could be sterilized, but in most cases, um, it was only in institutions, and so it would be the director of the institution, a mental institution, or an institution for the, quote, feeble-minded, um, that sort of thing, or a penal institution where there were inmates. But um, in North Carolina, it was the only state that allowed social workers to make those sorts of decisions, and so that's why it stood out. And the other reason why North Carolina stood out is that after World War II, people became aware of, of how Hitler um, practiced eugenics to try to create his master race. And um, most of the state then cut back on their programs, but North Carolina just kicked it into gear. So it was one of the, um, the only state that sterilized more people than North Carolina was California. And, uh, and even California sort of cut way back after World War II. So, uh, to, does that answer your question about the other states? Yeah. Amy, what I loved about, about Necessary Lies and more than your other books, not that I didn't love your other books, was that if when I really thought about the eugenics program, and it seemed like Charlotte um, had all the best intentions, that these weren't people with bad intentions, and it helped make it a very well-rounded book. And mm. how were you able to write something that in 2013 seems so horrible and so long ago that was actually thought to be helpful back in 1960 in a way that was both sympathetic and horrific. Yeah, I think that that's a really good point, that most of the people, particularly in the beginning of the program, most of the people who were um, making the decisions to sterilize other people really had the best intentions. They were trying to protect people who couldn't defend themselves because of their mental retardation, um, or they were trying to protect other people from um, sex abusers, that sort of thing. But um, it became, when it started to creep into people who were on the welfare rolls, then it became um, much easier to abuse. And I think what I try to show in the story is that there are social workers who had absolutely the best intentions with their clients, um, trying to protect them through the sterilization, uh, as well as there were social workers who really did believe that we should cut the welfare rolls and this is the way to do it. And I, I point out that even after this program was over, there were doctors not just in North Carolina, but doctors who insisted that their patients be sterilized after a third baby was born on welfare or else they wouldn't treat their patients. So there's a, there are a lot of different avenues um, to this whole forced sterilization issue. There was a story on the news about five years ago wanted to have their severely disabled daughter sterilized and have her have a hysterectomy so that she would be easier to care for. And I don't know if you remember that was on the news, but there were a lot of ethics. So it's, your story is also topical today on 
a, a more smaller scale rather than the macro scale. So I just think it was a great topic, and I could I've read it like three or four. I've read Necessary Lies like three or four times already. I just love it. About the same amount of time as I read it. <laughs> um, I think the big difference, Amy, though, is that uh, it's not the state making the decision now, and that's that was to me what was wrong with the situation back then. Is oh, sure. you know now it's caretakers and that kind of thing, but to have this the state have that power was was just not right in my opinion. Yeah, I have to say that one of the things that I loved the most about your book was the fact that you presented all these different points of view. And I think in a good fiction, really what happens is that you make people feel the way it would feel for each of these persons. What is amazing in your novel is that you presented all these different points of view. You made us feel like the person who makes the decision, like the person who is having second thoughts, like the person who is actually trying to save themselves, themselves we're discovering what is happening. And I just wonder which one of these voices did you find the most difficult to, to write? You know, um, neither. In this book, there's really three points of view. Yeah. Uh, Ivy, the 15-year-old girl who is um, supposedly going to be sterilized, and Jane, her social worker, and um, there's Brenna, who has a very bit part at the beginning and the end. And so Jane and Ivy really carry the story, and I actually found both of their voices very easy for me. Once I found the rhythm of Ivy's voice, Ivy being a, a very poor um, white girl living in a tenant's farmer's house on a tobacco farm. Once I got her voice, I I just loved it. It was so much fun to write from her point of view and to kind of feel the way she was feeling. And also to keep in mind um, her IQ level and to try to write, you know, not too sophisticated, but not really, um, she definitely wasn't what was considered feeble-minded back then. Yeah. And then Jane was also very easy for me because um, of my own background as a social worker. The, the thing that was hard for me with Jane is was to keep her from being too sophisticated as a social worker because I, my own voice, my own social worker voice kept coming through and so I had to keep reminding myself that she hadn't she didn't have a master's degree in social work. She didn't even have a bachelor's degree in social work. Yeah. So um, that's one reason why I gave her a lot of books to study, because I wanted her to have a sense of how to interview people and that kind of thing. But she was just learning, and I really liked watching her kind of fumble her way through mm -hmm. her interviews. Yeah. Great. Yes, I'm still here. <laughs> um, I. What did you? With your background in social work, I know you probably. I know from you know today's day and age to compare the back, you know back then. What did you find like most shocking? I guess what. What really hit you the hardest about writing Necessary Lies? Hmm. Um, I think, you know, doing the research into the program and, and hearing about some situations that I actually didn't put in the book, because in the book I wanted it to be much more typical the way that um, these cases would actually come up. But there were extreme cases that I heard about in my research that were very distressing. For example, there was a um, one case that I came across where a father was molesting his teenage daughter, and he's the one who signed the consent form to have her sterilized. Oh, so, you know, real horror stories like that, but they were not the norm. The norm was just people 
being um, sterilized without really knowing what was happening to them. And did that you, I mean, is very difficult. Did, did you speak with anyone who had been through the program? No. Um, I spoke to social workers, I spoke to psychologists, but I did not speak to any of the people who had been forced, forced into sterilization. And I, I did that for a reason. Um, I don't like to use anybody's real story. And I felt as though if I spoke to somebody and got their real story, that there's no way I could do justice to what happened to that person. And I also didn't want to feel like I was exploiting them in any way. So for those reasons, I just completely disregarded speaking to anybody. But I did watch, and anybody can watch it on YouTube, the hearings from 2011. Um, at the back of my book, I have a link to the hearing, and um, it, where you can hear people talk about their experience, both men and women. And I wonder, I know that the book has released very recently, but have you had any feedback from people that have been directly um, affected by this program? I haven't yet. Um, mm -hmm. I, I expect that that will happen, but I haven't heard from anybody, whether it is um, a social worker or um, somebody in the government or one of the victims. I haven't heard from anybody yet who was um, part of the program in any way. So uh, we'll see. We'll see yeah. if I do hear from somebody. Right. Amy? Um, with, with Jane, with, um, Jane, as I noticed as, the, as she became more invested in Ivy and became more of an advocate for her, she also became more assertive with her husband. Was that, was that, um, was, was that sort of planned to be parallel, or did that just happen? I would say it happened organically. You know, I think that that side of Jane, that, that strong, tough side, was always inside of her. But um, you have to remember that they did not, she and her husband didn't know each other very long before they got married. And I think that um, things that he, you know, that little spark in her that he really appreciated when she was just his girlfriend um, wasn't very attractive to him once she was his wife and so I think that um, I think it was the real Jane coming out she probably wasn't letting all that much of that side of herself come out you know she went to that church which is a real church in Wally the Pullen Baptist Church and it's a very, and has always been a very socially progressive church. And she was going to change over to his church. But she had that background in her family that you help people. Mm -hmm. And so for her, it was uh, really important that she continue that in her job. And then, of course, she had um, her, the accident that involved her sister and her sister's death. And so all of that, I think, played into who she was and who she became as she started working with the Hart family and the other families. Now, I also wanted to ask you, because obviously the, the sterilization program is sort of the center of the story, but there's lots of other social issues in your book. You know, the whole idea of the, the marriage, the the role of the women in the marriage and in society, there's just a lot more sort of a background to this, to this novel that just this center plot. So I imagine you, you must have done a lot of all sorts of different kind of things all along this process, aside of the sterilization program. Was there any other uh, sort of discovery that you have done along this, this, this research that really surprised you? You know, um, because I was alive and 10 years old in 1960, there really wasn't a whole lot that did surprise me. Even in the late 60s, when I was old enough to be going to a gynecologist, and um, I got those same kinds of 
um, feedback from Dr. This is the late 60s. You know, I'm not, I don't want to give you the pill. I want your husband to give me his permission to pill. And, um, and it didn't happen to me, but I know a friend was congratulated for being a virgin by the doctor. And it's just um, sort of unbelievable in 2013, but it really surprised me because it was all out of my memory. Yeah, that it's not long ago. Not, no, it's really not that long ago. When people call this a historical novel, my friends who are my age and I are like, what? <laughs> We just can't believe it. <laughs> well, I guess it just indicates and show you the speed of the of the changes. It's sort of accelerating as we are advancing. Things are changing a lot faster. And even though in a grand scheme of things we're thinking, you know, that's only 30, 40 years ago, it really, in the way of the progress, it seems like a light year uh, away. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, Bree, have you had any other questions? Um, I did want to ask one other one. I know um, <clears throat> towards the end, um, in your uh, author's note, kind of, you had mentioned also to that um, the state um, went ahead in the pool. Um, and then, but the Senate had, um, they still were, I guess they refused to support. Mm -hmm. Have you heard anything? Uh -huh. I know that that was at the time of you writing Necessary Lives, right. but has anything changed? Or yes, it has. Um, much to my shock and happiness, they have passed the bill to compensate the victims. Okay. So uh, there's $10 million in the state budget that in 2015 people have until 2015 to come forward. And whoever has come forward and is shown to actually have been part of this forced sterilization, um, in 2015 they will be splitting this pool of $10 million. So I honestly can't believe it. You really don't want to get me started on North Carolina politics because <laughs> um, I'm not real happy about it right now. But that is one good thing. That's good. Okay. Amy, have you got one last question? Yes. Um, I noticed that you used the word um, Negro for, um, to describe black people, African Americans. Is there a reason that you chose not to use the N word? with having the, the, the characters talk to each other? Um, I really do not believe that this particular set of characters would be using the N-word. It's, it's used in the book by some other characters, but um, and most of these characters use the word color. And I know when I was growing up, that was the word that we used, and I spoke to friends um, in North Carolina, which is where I live, so I have plenty of friends who lived in rural environments, and most of them used the word colored also. So um, the, the characters that I do have used the M word are um, the guys in the truck uh, who try to accost Jane, um, yeah. people who have rougher edges than the characters that I wrote about. So I felt comfortable with that choice. I was just curious. Yeah. Well, Jan, thank you very much for this uh, conversation. Um, I hope that, uh, and I don't think we have given away too much for the for the future uh, readers of this book, and hopefully we've inspired lots more people to actually look for this book. Um, I have to say, and I've seen some of the uh, spoken to some of the people that read it. It's, a, it's a really a book that stays uh, with the reader for a long time. And for myself personally, I have to say it's been now probably a few weeks as I read it, but uh, both um, Ivy and uh, Mary Ella and baby William and Jane, they all stay with in my mind and I keep thinking about that beautiful scene on the, when they go to, the, uh, to see the beach for the first time. And I keep mm -hmm. thinking of them in that particular scene and somehow there's something about it that 
is so hopeful at the same time as it said. I think it gives a really good sort of idea of how amazing that story is. So thank you very much. And, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, and 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 see you again on our on our site. And uh, for all those that are watching us, please go to the readingroom.com. Uh, have a look at the uh, at the site of um, Diane on her page, and make sure to leave the comments and uh, inspire more readers to come to her book. And thank you also to Bree and Amy for participating. And uh, have a great day. Thank, thank you. you so much, Anna. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody. Bye. bye.